Hey, what's going on, miners? Today, we're going to be talking about day two of Mikko Trick Trading. So let's get right into it. The Meter Box and Octo Miner are teaming up for another exciting giveaway. Win the latest proof of useful work, Octo Server E10, and X8 Ultra Plus, and more. Introducing the limited edition Octo Miner box set by Meter Box. It includes the 125 volt and 250 volt meter boxes, a special NFT, stickers, and a keychain. Hurry, only 250 box sets available. Visit themeterbox.com now to secure yours today. Purchase the Octo Miner box set and unlock a secret code for 1,000 entries. Plus, earn an extra 1,000 entries and receive that collectible NFT. Don't miss out. The contest ends July 30th. So, today's second day. It was a super much longer day than the first day. Really tired. Uh, I just got home. I took a two-hour nap, and I just woke up. So, I'm, I, it's been a really, really long day today. Um, but I learned a lot. So, let's talk about a couple things I didn't talk about before um, with um, some things I learned about the other day about MicroTix. So, one is they do have a safe mode which is kind of nice because let's say I'm remoting into a network and I need to make a change and I'm not sure if I'm going to lock myself out because it does happen from networking. Sometimes you can make a change that would lock yourself out and then you're not going to have access anymore. But what safe mode is, is if you click that on, what will happen is if you make the change and kick yourself out, it will automatically edit and undo that as soon as you're kicked. So that way you can reconnect, which is really cool, especially if you're doing stuff remote, right? Um, so another thing too is called, uh, I don't know. I think I might've talked about it yesterday, but I don't remember is Roman. So Roman is, is a cool feature by Microtech, which essentially is like, let's say I'm having Hawk deploy this switch, right? It's not Microtech. We're, we're just going to pretend he's going to put it on the network floor down in Florida. I'm not there. I'm over here in Arizona, right? But I am already logged into the back end network of our network in Florida, right? Well, after he plugs in the switch, right? Plugs in the ethernet or the SFP or whatever we're using. What I could do then is, is I could actually, it'll pop up on the network with a Mac telnet because it won't get an IP address because it hasn't been configured yet, whether to use a static or be able to do DHCP yet because it's a brand new switch, right? But I'll still see the Mac address on the, um, on the back end of the IP neighbors. So what I could do then is do a telnet MAC address to it. And what will happen is, is I can then remote into this and do the uh, telnet. And essentially what I could do is, is do a command line where it's um, tools set enabled Roman. And then what that would let me do is, is connect to it from Winbox, which is the program we use to connect to our Microtix. So really, really cool. So you could set up lots and lots of things remotely and not even physically be there, which is really, really cool, especially for me since I live in Arizona. Now, today we did learn a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, not like, not a lot. We learned a lot about networking in general. Also learned a lot of stuff about networking. So one thing that we did that we did learn about today was the switch chip. Now, in most newer Microtix, not in a lot of the older ones, but in most of the newer ones here, they have a little ASIC chip inside of them, and it's called a switch chip. And it does, it does switching very, very fast and offloads everything from the CPU. So this way, the CPU itself doesn't have to do any heavy lifting, which is amazing, right? So to kind of put that in perspective, um, the gentleman who's teaching me, he, sh he showed me his... Um, his um, West uh, network that he manages with this program. And it's like 250 square miles and it has, dude, there's so many, there's like tens of thousands of clients on it. And one router, right. Which was like way out in the middle of nowhere was give, was doing about like three and a half gigs each way. Right. Symmetrical. And that CPU on that particular like router, right. For that setup, for those people, that little router way out there in the middle of nowhere, its CPU usage was 1%, 1% because everything was offloaded to the switch chip. So the switch chip is very, very powerful. It could offload lots of, we, we technically most times, if you can, the idea is to use the switch chip and how do we use the switch chip? So we'd like to put things in what's called a bridge. 
And essentially, anything that you put into the bridge will use the switch chip. That way, none of those things will ever touch the CPU. The only things that you can't do um, as far as for in, in the switch chip itself is going to be things that have to do with the firewall, like the NAT and like um, and like static routes and, and the route policies and stuff like that. That stuff you cannot do inside of the switch chip that has to be done at the CPU level because then the CPU needs to think about, okay, does this apply to my firewall or not? And then it passes it through. So things like that don't get... Um, don't get through the switch chip, but everything else does. You can add VLANs to the switch chip. Um, so to give you an example, which was really awesome, right, is um, the little router I had that's actually this big, it, it actually has a um, wireless on it, right? And what I did was is, is I used that to connect to his wireless network at, at, at his house, right? And so I got internet from the wireless, right? But my laptop was going to like ether two right here. Right. So my laptop had the Wi-Fi disabled, right? Well, I created a bridge, right? So anything that's on the bridge will, will be able to share the, um, the DHCP and stuff like that. So I essentially, what I did was, is I made a bridge and then I put the wireless WAN on the bridge and I put my ether two port, that my laptop was on, on the bridge as well. And guess what? I had internet. Even though that the switch wasn't physically plugged into any kind of internet port, I was getting the internet from the Wi-Fi. So just like some really cool like little tricks and tips I learned today about how to use the bridge. So, and um, how to offload things to the switch chip. So we also learned about like IPv4, layer one, layer two, and layer three. Um, layer one is like the physical layer, which is like stuff like um, like doing low voltage, like Cat6 cable and like the actual physical hardware itself, right? Like the switches and like the ports you plug them into. That's layer one, right? Layer two is on the MAC address level, right? Which is where things don't have an IP address yet, but they're able to talk to each other on the MAC address level. And then layer three has to do with IP addresses. So just to give you guys kind of an idea of some of the stuff, you know, that we went over today was like IBV4, you know, static routes, um, route policies. Uh, we, did a, we didn't really go into the firewall too much. We set a couple basic firewall rules. And then we also learned about wireless, about the 802.11 concepts and all of the standards and um, 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, 900 megahertz. We learned about the R uh, RS uh, RSSI, the noise level um, and obviously the noise floor, uh, signal to noise ratios and things like that. So this is how you can tell if you're actually getting a good signal with your Wi-Fi as well as the uh, Fresno uh, concept, which is essentially as you get further and further away from your point to point, let's say, is the wider the um, your your um, your Fresnel concept will be so essentially like if you're super far away, it could be up to 136 feet wide, which is the wavelength that things are passing through. So then you have to do the calculation to figure out if if your wavelength is say 50 feet wide, right? Does that go through a tree, right? And how much of that wavelength is obstructed if 40% more of, of the wavelength is compromised, then you won't have a good connection. So, um, learn. <laughs> so I learned a lot, a lot of stuff today. Like there's so many topics I couldn't even like put them in. This video would be as long as I, as I was there. Right. And I don't want to do that to you guys. So I learned a ton of information. So that's just kind of a few things I learned today. Um, I have three more, three more modules to do tomorrow, which will take me probably till noon to get through. And then um, I'll have to take the test. So I need a 60% or higher um, to be able to take, uh, to, to pass the test. Um, it is an open book test though. So I can use things like the router, like I can log into my router with my laptop. And if it's asking me a specific question, if this does this, is this true? And I can be like, well, I can test that real quick. Get in my router, 
and I can type everything in there and test it and see if it passes through or not. And if it doesn't, then I can obviously mark false, right? So it is an open book test. You can use like Google and things like that. The only thing is, is the obviously the instructor can't give you like the answers. Um, he can help you try and understand the question um, if you're not understanding how it's worded, but he can't give you answers. So uh, I need a, so tomorrow, big test, um, the MTC uh, NA um, test. It's the bigger of the tests. Um, so I need to pass it because I have to pass this one before I can actually go on to the next one. So if I don't pass, I have to wait four days before I can take the next test. So hopefully you guys wish me luck and I pass. Um, I've been putting in a lot of hours driving back and forth, really concentrating on this stuff. So really do appreciate it. So, um, yeah, it was like, we crammed a lot of information today, like so much information. I am, I, I'm annihilated, dude. I'm, I'm exhausted. So, um, Anyways, guys, <laughs> this is Money King giving you the most hashes, and I'll see you next time.